going to be held by those individuals who have been harmed the most. To me, this is a statement of the responsibility of all of us as citizens to figure out how to disrupt these kinds of patterns so that when trauma has occurred in the, in the psyches of particular individuals, it doesn't stay lodged there forever, but rather we sort of take it back as a community and, and together restore that, um, that experience. So I think I'll leave it at that. And we have at least maybe, what, 15 minutes for questions? Um, oh, and uh, one, one last thing to say is that um, one of the things that has been just amazing to me in this whole endeavor is that um, one of the women who first contacted me to say, oh my gosh, I saw your stuff, was somebody who had begun organizing people online. Her name is Catherine Whitehead, and she has since developed a group that's called Safety with a C, and it's um, a coalition for, um, let me see if I can get it right, um, oh, Community, Community Alliance for the Ethical Treatment of Youth. And this is a youth, um, a youth organized and a youth-led nonprofit organization now um, of folks who have been themselves um, participants in their own adolescence in, in these kinds of programs. And they have this group that they refer to as their trauma and recovery group. And so just today, just like two hours before you know I came here or finished the final stuff. Um, you know, I got this invite through Facebook saying that they're um, organizing a private group to read and discuss a particular book, but to really serve as a forum. So it's one of the examples of youth um, restoring uh, their own well-being, which I think offers great promise. Um, so now I'll leave it at that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, there was legislation most recently that is um, not yet in effect, right? Um, but it's at least, um, I mean, it's, it's not yet been sort of brought to life. But yes, I think that we're finally seeing that, um, that tide turning. Right, so... Um, this was another thing that we had an opportunity to then consult around somewhat, uh, the, the formulating of legislation and, um, and then learned about a lot of the political realities that then um, wind up whittling legislation, right? But the idea is that if the federal government were to have some standards at this point, it's almost like making it clear that, um, that states need to find some way, need to begin finding ways to regulate all of their residential facilities and not have loopholes. So therapeutic boarding school is not a loophole or a particular name is not a loophole, um, that all of them then are to become um, licensed and regulated within the state. And it's still up to states, but there are incentives for states to, um, if they actually get this in place, to then, um, it's tied to some of the other kind of federal um, you know, resources that exist. There was, um, and I need to read the sort of the final, um, what, what got actually passed, but there was also discussion of creating a, a clearinghouse of information and a way for there to be um, continually updated um, information about the programs and about what's happened in programs. Again, a lot of the things that exist in licensed residential treatment facility um, rules and regs just needing to be extended to these programs. And so again, from a policy perspective, that has great potential and was, I think, experienced as, quote, a win in terms of addressing this phenomenon. At the same time, I think that, like so many other things, if it's not something that's happening, um, whether you say it top down, bottom up, or every which way, then I don't know that the phenomenon itself has changed all that much yet because some states like Utah that have had state legislation for several years now are still describing, I mean youth are describing that their experience in programs does not look all that much different or feel that much different than it did before. So. Any other impressions or? There was one thing that I wanted to discuss. I have a, a friend of mine who's had, they have legitimately had some, a lot of trouble with, with their son. Um, for, for reasons I just don't know how to articulate. Um, they sent their child to a, a, a facility. 
facility like this. And and he described I, I, when I read read the, the, the report um, that you posted, I was blown away because I thought to myself, Oh my God! You know, he describes almost everything that you had in there. And um, but and they had been told too, you know. So I had heard about this before reading the, the, this report months ago. And they had been told to, you know, that uh, he's going to use manipulation tactics and this type of thing, make up stories. But this is a child who does, who has been caught before lying and exaggerating and making things up. And now he has this experience where he's probably not lying about it. But the assumption, it, they just flew to the assumption that he's lying about it. Yeah. And that. I don't Yeah. What, do you, what do you do for a family in that in that situation where they have just been pressed to the wall? Right. They need to do something. That yeah, I think that one of the things that really is pretty tragic here is that, you know, families choose this because it feels like it's better than what they imagine the alternative is for their child and family, right? And that often people don't make these kinds of choices until they really feel like things are over you know, sort of beyond the pale, beyond their capacity to deal with the situation in their communities, right? And so like you're saying, then, if there's been a pattern of um, distrust already, then this just kind of can feed into it. But I do think that this is another reason why increased, um, you know, even, you know, increased, um, you know, scholarship and publications about it that people can turn to so that it's not just they're describing their experience, but that it shows that um, compatibility between what they're describing and and what has been sort of substantiated in some form. And then, of course, you know, traditional social science would certainly be helpful here with regard to a much more thorough and exhaustive description of, of what's going on. And as I said, the GAO, uh, Government Accountability Office, has done some work that I think um, is helpful in that regard. And the legislation may also make it possible to begin developing sort of more of a, a database that substantiates it. I guess I'm still in disbelief that there's not much more that could be done. Help me understand, if somebody left a facility like that and lodged a complaint, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be like um, child protective services or child abuse investigators right. that would go into... Um, right, so, so what happens oftentimes um, is that somebody says, I got treated like this by the staff. I mean, there were times where I made calls to different state um, child protective services to say, I'm a licensed child psychologist. I am man I'm a mandated reporter. And I was told, number one, if you don't know who the person perpetuating this um, mistreatment was. And secondly, that's about a program. And so you need to go to the program office. But what we found was that it was like, because there are these loopholes, like the you know, the entities that oversee mental health programs say, oh, well, it's not a mental health program, call education. Education says, oh, well, it's not an education. So it is in this abyss. And so truly there were a number of situations where it was not possible. Nobody would take, nobody would take the report, basically. Um, and I think that that absolutely, I would say, you know, ab abuse, if, if the behavior of abuse happens, then it would make sense that you could report it. I mean, there are programs, there was one in um, New York in recent times that, you know, the kids actually revolted and, and, and sort of stormed the place, you know, sort of like what you hear about in prisons. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, when it's taking that kind of response, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> I would go to a place like the, sa the safety website if, um, you know, to sort of, there are at least groups that are trying now to think about, it. it is, it's, it's, astounding that it can be this way. And I think that because it's so astounding, people think like, oh, please, this has got to be a bunch of like drama kings and queens that are making a big deal, you know, and um, it's just so out, it seems so outlandish, you know, and, and I remember presenting at the American Psychological Association, and it was the year, I don't know, I think it was 2006, where APA was taking up all this stuff about will psychologists serve in the military in um, in relation to interrogations, and there was all this